Thank you for tuning in to KROW, Florence's only Corvid-run radio station. Yes, that's Corvid, not COVID, for those of you who are smarty pants. Mr. Webster defines Corvid as a bird of the crow family, Corvidae. And if you're listening to us, you are definitely crow family. Kaka! Thank you for listening to KROW. <laughs> All you cats and kittens, this is Wolfman Mike, and you're listening to K-R-O-W, the only radio station guaranteed to carve a grin right onto your jack-o'-lantern. Coming up is the sad tale of an underwater maiden whose fondest nightmares did not come true. Hmm, something's fishy about this story. Sit back and relax while we spin you the seaside saga of the little fear maid. The little fear maid. Not many people know this, but once upon a time, there was a beautiful mermaid named Ariel, who had a twin sister named Scariel. As sweet and wonderful as Ariel was, her sister Scariel was a bad girl, just plain bad. Both girls wanted to learn all about the people that live in the mysterious world above. Ariel collected many souvenirs she called thingamabobs from her trips to the surface. She loved them all. Scariel also collected things, things she called weapons, and dragged them into her secret lair where she hoped one day they would come in handy for her evil schemes. One day there was a terrible storm. Just as his ship was about to be lost forever, a handsome prince named Eric was rescued by one Ariel and flopped around like a halibut in the shallow water near the beach. Then, Prince Eric was pulled to the shore by Scariel and seemed to be out of danger. But was he really? Was he really? (laughs) On the beach, the sounds of a terrifying and unearthly voice awoke Prince Eric and he threw up a whole bunch of seawater. It wasn't pretty. But before he could react, people began to rush to help him and frighten Scariel away. Furious, Scariel was forced to once again hide in the ocean. After doing a big production number and arching her back on a rock, pretending to be her sister. Later on, sulking in her underwater lair, Scariel began to make plans to get her revenge, while her sister Ariel watched Prince Eric from behind some rocks on the beach and fell instantly in love with him, mostly his hair. And he had beautiful teeth. Meanwhile, Scariel plotted and longed to be able to terrify Eric some more with her screeching voice. She yearned for the day she could drag him back under the water and keep him there forever. To do this, she needed to become a short-term creature of the dry land. She needed a plan. But what and who would agree to help her? She could only think of one accomplice, the evil sea witch, Ursula. Her daddy, King Triton, was at his wit's end with his rotten child. How he wished that both twins were like his good daughter. When he learned of Scariel's plans from that little goody two-shoes and tattletale Ariel, he totally freaked out, like dads sometimes do. He burst into Scariel's secret lair and destroyed most of her stash of weapons, blasting them all to smithereens. Scariel was grounded, or rather waterlogged, until she was 21. King Triton was not, shall we say, a people person. In fact, He hated people and didn't want either of his mermaid daughters to be among the people above. But Scariel was more resourceful than Daddy knew. Not to be thwarted, she used her screechy voice to summon Ursula's equally evil moray eel companions, Flotsam and Jetsam. She sent off the dangerous duo to bring Ursula to her ASAP. Like, now. Scariel was convinced that Ursula could make her nightmares come true, and she was willing to risk everything she had to make it happen. Meanwhile, Scariel's slaves, a fish named Sounder and a crab named Fabastian, 
were forced to support her and performed a whole bunch of big show tune production numbers as a distraction from Scariel's plot. When the sea witch Ursula snuck into Scariel's lair for the meeting, her conditions to give Scariel legs were harsh. Prince Eric had to kiss her within three days. Otherwise, she'd have to return to the depths of the sea and become a slave to the witch Ursula forever. Thoughtlessly, Scariel agreed, and poof, she had legs. She never was the bright one of Triton's daughters. But she didn't realize that Ursula had also taken her screechy voice away. How was she going to lure Eric into going along with her plan? This story just wasn't working out the way she had planned. Meanwhile, that sneaky pants Ursula had plans of her own. She took the form of a beautiful maiden with Ariel's voice. Her wicked plot almost worked, but at the last minute she was outed by Ariel herself, the good twin. Then some other stuff happened. Ariel conveniently popped up from behind her rocks and saved Prince Eric. Unfortunately for Ariel, Prince Eric, who was kind of a dope, finally realized that this falling in love with mermaids wasn't all it was cracked up to be. So he left both girls right there on the beach and rode off to the neighboring kingdom to marry a human princess named Henrietta who didn't have so much baggage. Ursula's spell was now broken, as was Ariel's heart. But she would get over it as soon as she met a nice suitable merman. At least that was what her dad thought. There might be a sequel. Scariel had to return to her original state of badge of the bone fish chick. And since the rule said that she had to go back into the depths of the sea, some might think that this story still has a happy ending. But it doesn't. Sinking into a deep, dark depression, the mermaid Scariel decided that the only way to drown her sorrows was to eat her friends, Sounder and Fabastian, and to spend the rest of her days underwater, moping over the plot that failed and the world above. The end. Do you need your fangs sharpened? Is it time for your pet werewolf to have his toenails trimmed? Or, or is that machete loosen its pointy edge? Well, 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 Harvest House of Horrors is now offering sharpening services seven days a week, folks. No appointment needed. So swing on by Harvey's House of Horrors, located in Old Town, and we'll <laughs> hook you up. <laughs> the following joke is sponsored by Florence Shipping Solutions, located at 2006 Highway 101 in Florence. Whether you need to send a package, print documents, open a mailbox, or ship a dead body, Florence Shipping Solutions has got you covered. How did the little ghost learn to play piano? By using sheet music. Who was the most famous skeleton detective? Why, it was Sherlock Bones, of course. It's elementary. The following joke is sponsored by Christina Voog. If you're looking for the perfect spooky castle, or would like to purchase a graveyard, or maybe some bubbling, oozing swamplands, Christina Voog at Berkshire Hathaway Northwest Real Estate can help you make your dreams come true. What do you call a skeleton that makes you laugh when you're sad? A funny bone. What goes, ha ha ha, thud. A zombie laughing his head off. What do birds give out on Halloween? Tweets. Hi everybody, this is Melanie Hurd, Crow's Artistic Director and Founder. I just wanted to say thank you so much for being here tonight and for supporting our program. Also, I wanted to let you know that we are doing a fundraiser with the Oregon Coast Humane Society, and it is a fabulous calendar featuring the Tutu Dads and the pets of the Oregon Coast Humane Society. For more information, check out our website at www.crowkids.com. We now return to our regularly scheduled scares. <laughs> Coming up is yet another classic tale of mischief and mayhem. Two of my favorite things. 
You may have heard the story of a magical nanny named Mary Poppins, but have you heard the twisted version? No? Well, you're in for a real trick or treat. Here comes the frightening tale of Scary Poppins. The wind was about to change in London, but not in a good way as most might think. Few people know that long before she became the clever and sweet nanny that the beloved children's story was written about, Mary Poppins had a wicked and sinister alter ego named Scary Poppins. Both Scary Poppins and Mary Poppins practiced magic, but while Mary Poppins eventually learned how to do only the good kind, her evil alter ego was out for blood. Scary Poppins created terrible problems wherever she went, and long before she met Jane and Michael Banks, she invaded a different family's home, and made that poor family's troubles even worse. One thunderstormy day, Scary arrived suddenly on the wind on the doorstep of their family's home at number 17 Ferry Tree Lane. The children, strangely also named Jane and Michael, had driven off yet another nanny with their naughty behavior. Their father, George, was gone all the time working at the credit union, and his poor wife, Winnebago, could barely dress and feed herself, let alone be helpful with her own children. Scary Poppins suddenly appeared on their doorstep and managed to charm her way in with some strange concoction she claimed to be sugar. Once hired, Scary immediately started to bully Jane and Michael and frighten them by threatening to make their toys come alive and chase them around the house. Side note, this terrifying number was later cut from the Broadway musical for this very reason. It was nightmarish! <sighs> when George came home from work, Scary made up evil lies about the children's behavior and told him that she'd do whatever she could to mold them into the kind of obedient little kids that George wanted. Meanwhile, Scary started locking poor Michael and Jane in their rooms and taking them outside to play. She fed them lots of magical cakes and other delicious and rich foods to eat though, and the reason for that will be made clear later. All you need to know is that she kept giving them spoonfuls and spoonfuls of sugar. Scary's friend, a chimney sweep named Bert, got all of his chimney sweep buddies together and they did a big tap dance number on the rooftops, but sadly, nobody was there to see it. Least of all, Jane and Michael, who were still locked in their rooms eating rich sugary and fatty foods. The same day, George arrived home in a terrible mood because Scary made one of his business decisions fail, and he had been placed on suspension with no pay. He was furious that the sweeps had invaded his house and left ashes and soot all over the fancy furniture. Scary was thrilled at the havoc she had created. Things were going from bad to worse, and Scary loved it all. Finally, the worst moment of this entire story took place. Scary lured Jane and Michael Bakes down to the kitchen, where she promptly roasted them in a large oven and served them to their own family for dinner. George commented how delicious the meal was, and Winnebago just smiled and made a frivolous comment about how quiet the children are being. Scary Poppins was soon discovered to be a real monster and was forced to attend a multi-step program for evil nannies. After the program, she was reintroduced into society as a new version of herself, Mary Poppins. Apparently, the judicial system wasn't very harsh on nannies who ate children in 1910, but I'm pretty sure that the laws have changed by now. Very few people know the real story about who sweet Mary Poppins used to be before the popular story was released, but now you do, and chances are you'll never be able to forget it. Ha 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 ha! K R O W Parking Lot Radio. Do you wish you had more spiders in your attic? How about extra bats in your belfry? 
Do you need green slime oozing out of your bathtub? Or simply some things that go bump in the night? If so, you need to call Jimmy Joe's Handy Monster Service. We can make your floorboards creak and get the pipes in your house to shriek. Jimmy Joe's staff of Handy Monsters include an unlicensed electrician, a lousy plumber, and all around Mr. Can't Fix It. We literally charge an arm and a leg, usually have no idea what's really wrong, and we never call you back. So contact Jimmy Joe's Handy Monster Service today. We put the in repairs. Not licensed for the CCD, not affiliated with any known professional entities. Jimmy Joe has no comment about any pending litigation or jail time and does not guarantee homeowner safety during or after a completed Handy Monster project. Are you a lonely monster? Do you sometimes have a hard time finding a ghoul friend or boil? Please allow me to help. I'm Count Matchmaker, and I am happy to announce my new dating service for creatures of the night like you and me. All you need to do is download my all-new Batty Dates app on your iPhone or Android and get ready for your love life to take flight. That's Batty Dates, guaranteed to introduce you to terrifying monsters just like yourself. Only $59.95 per month. Join Batty Dates today and scare loneliness away. <laughs> The following joke is sponsored by Bonnie Welch and John Egar. Thank you, Bonnie and John, for showing you care by helping us scare. What did the skeleton buy at the grocery store? Spare ribs. What did the little vampire say when he went to bed? Turn on the dark. I'm afraid of the light. Why do witches wear name tags? So they'll know which which is which. What do you get when you cross a snowman with a vampire? Frostbite. The following joke is sponsored by Chad and Kem Clement. Chad Clement, DDS, PC, is a fiend family dental office with a relaxing riverfront view. Since 2008, Dr. Clement's office has been committed to providing drop-dead gorgeous smiles. Thank you very much for your sponsorships, Chad and Kim. What did the vampire say to his victim? It's been nice gnawing you. You're still listening to K-R-O-W, your spooky and kooky parking lot radio channel. And now, here's Heather Feathers, our very own completely unqualified meteorologist. Like, hi everyone, I'm Heather Feathers, your chick with the weathers. So, I consulted the stars and stuff, and they told me to stop texting them. So, I'm really not sure what the weather's going to be like, but I can tell you this. It rains a lot here. So if it's raining right now, just remember that your chick with the weathers, Heather Feathers, told you that it might rain. And if it's not raining right now, well, then you should totally go outside and stuff. Well, unless it's dark, because it's almost Halloween and something spooky might be lurking in the bushes. Speaking of something spooky, I'm going to turn it back over to Wolfman Mike. Ow! Thank you for listening to K-R-O-W. Next up on K-R-O-W is a story that is near and dear to my own scary, hairy heart. Rumor has it that there is an ogre vampire somewhere in the swamps of Florence. Have you seen him? Better hold on tight to your onions and enjoy the story of Shrekula. Once upon a time, there was a large green ogre named Shrekula. As big as he was, he had terribly low self-esteem. This made him very antisocial and highly territorial. Shrekula lived in a damp and musty swamp castle next to a graveyard, all by himself. He had all kinds of annoying ailments like athlete's foot and stinky breath, 
from his miserable environment, which gave him a very bad attitude and drove everyone away in disgust. It was his own fault. One day, while sulking next to his swamp pond, Shrekula was interrupted by an unwelcome guest in the misshapen form of Lord Farquaad of Duloc. This didn't improve Shrekula's mood one bit, since pretty much all guests were unwelcome. After several minutes of furious roaring and anger by Shrekula and stamping around by the obnoxious Farquaad on his tiny feet, Shrekula listened long enough to find out that Farquaad had exiled a vast number of fairy tale creatures from his kingdom to Shrekula's swamp castle. Then Farquaad left in a hurry, before Shrekula could lift him up and throw him into the pond. Soon, Shrekula was surrounded by a huge group of pastel-clad fairy tale characters, all singing and dancing happy tunes for the big ensemble review. Shrekula was so stunned by this that he fell into the pond himself and emerged coughing and spluttering, wearing huge garlands of kutsu vines on his ears. The only member of this group that Shrekula could stand at all was a wiseacre, fast-talking donkey named Donkey. He decided he had to visit Farquaad and demand that the horrible, cute, and happy bunch be moved elsewhere immediately. And he reluctantly needed Donkey to guide him to Duloc. Off they went. Meanwhile, Farquaad made it back to his own mostly fairy tale character free castle and was presented with Snow White's magic mirror that she had fiendishly dropped off to taunt him with. While admiring himself in the mirror, the arrogant little toad was told by this somewhat vindictive and unreliable source that in order to become a true king, he must marry a princess. Being much too vain, the ugly three foot tall gnome Farquaad chose Princess Fiona, who was the most beautiful girl in the land. Unfortunately, she was currently imprisoned in a castle tower guarded by a dragon. Hmm, what to do? This presented a problem for Farquaad because, along with his other repellent characteristics, he was also a coward. But an idea popped up due to the fortunate arrival of Shrekula and Donkey, after an arduous journey described elsewhere. Having just come from his spa treatment and unwilling to ruin his manicure to rescue Fiona himself, Farquaad hatched a plan in which Shrekula and Donkey rescued Fiona for him, promising that he would remove the fairy tale creatures when they succeeded. He had his fingers crossed when he said it. Arrogant, vain, a coward, and a liar. What a catch for Fiona. Our heroes, Shrekula and Donkey, traveled to the dragon's lair, and were immediately attacked by the giant pink dragon, because, duh, what else was going to happen? But Shrekula somehow located Fiona, who was appalled by his lack of romanticism as well as his athlete's foot and bad breath, and they fled the castle after rescuing Donkey from the clutches of the now amorous dragon. When Shrekula removed his helmet, revealing he was an ogre vampire, Fiona stubbornly refused to go to Duloc. She had spunk, after all, and no ambitions to follow a green, stinky ogre vampire and a donkey anywhere. She demanded that Farquaad arrive in person and woo her. Only then would she decide. However, Shrekula picked her up and carried her away against her will. I mean, he was an ogre vampire, after all. Not much she could say about that, right? Plus, he wanted nothing more to do with a fire-breathing pink dragon. That night, after setting up camp and with Fiona alone in a cave, woohoo! Shrekula confided to Donkey about his frustration with being feared and rejected by others over his looks. They sang a song or two just to move the story along. Donkey suggested a few spa treatments and a many pet he couldn't hurt. Then, not to be outdone, he stepped out into the moonlight and revealed that he was not really a donkey, but a wicked donk wolf! He punctuated this confession with a fearsome howl at the moon. Emboldened, Shrekula also confessed that he was falling in love with Princess Fiona. Donkey confessed that his heart already belonged to Dragon in another song, which the director almost cut because, well, there was getting to be a lot of them. Later on, Donkey discovered that Fiona had transformed into an ogress vampire. She explained that she had been cursed since childhood, forced to transform every night after sunset and changing back at sunrise. She told Donkey that only true love's kiss would break the spell and change her to love's true form. Donkey made a mental note to suggest Shrekula visit the dentist, too. Meanwhile, as Shrekula was about to confess his feelings to Fiona, he overheard the conversation in which Fiona called herself an ugly beast. Believing that Fiona was talking about him, Shrekula angrily left and returned the next morning with Lord Farquaad. 
Confused and hurt by Shrekula's abrupt hostility toward her, Fiona accepted Farquaad's marriage proposal and insisted they be married before nightfall. <laughs> she was no fool. Well, she was sort of a fool to consent to marrying Farquaad, but she figured, how, how bad could it be, being the queen of a kingdom? A heartbroken Shrekula abandoned Donkey and returned to his now vacated swamp to mope, but realized that despite his privacy, he was miserable and missed Fiona. Donkey, of course, showed up in the nick of time to tell Shrekula the truth, and convinced him to rush off to the castle to try to stop the wedding. Which he did, by interrupting the wedding just before the ceremony was finished and informing Fiona that Farquaad was only marrying her to become king and probably planned to lock her up in a castle tower or something so he could continue his rich guy playboy lifestyle. Just then, the sun set, as Fiona transformed into an ogress vampire in front of everyone, causing a surprised Shrekula to understand what he overheard. Outraged, Farquaad was over behind the curtains throwing up at the deception of his ugly almost bride. But between gags, he ordered Trekula executed and Fiona put in chains. But... Dragon to the rescue this time! Dragon had fallen madly in love with Donkey because of his now slightly singed eyelashes, so she burst in and barbecued and devoured Farquaad. Trekula and Fiona professed their love and shared a slightly disgusting smooch. Fiona's curse was broken, permanently making her an ogress vampire a form that she wasn't expecting, but decided anything was better than being hitched to the odious Prince Farquaad, and she could work on Shrekula. So, anywho, Shrekula and Fiona got married in the Swamp Castle with a bunch of fairy tale creatures in attendance, and then they all danced to a late 1990s up-tempo pop song. The End. The following joke is sponsored by Florence in Bloom, home of many strange and unusual plants from outer space and experts in pushing up daisies. Call Florence in Bloom and they will help you get rid of your gloom. What do you call a ghost who gets too close to a bonfire? A toasty ghosty. The following joke is sponsored by Anglin Square Construction, LLC. If you need your haunted house remodeled, contact Angle and Square today. They're the experts in spiderweb installation, coffin building, stair creaking, and all around monster habitat maintenance. Thank you, Terry and Jeff. What is Dracula's favorite place in New York City? The Vampire State Building. What are the following joke is sponsored by r and King Logging, home of Lane County's original, scary, axe-wielding lumberjacks. If you need help chopping up things this Halloween, r and King Logging is the place to call. What fruit do scarecrows love most? Strawberries. How does a witch tell time? She looks at her witch watch. Why did the Headless Horseman go into business? He wanted to get ahead in life. Why did the zombie go trick-or-treating? He felt rotten. The following joke is brought to you by the bewitching Kim Anderson. Thank you, Kim. Knock, knock. Who's there? Ivana. Ivana who? Ivana Skiplop. Knock, knock. Who's there? I am. Diane who? I'm Diane to eat my Halloween candy. You're listening to K-R-O-W. Oh! Hi, I'm Boo Ryan. And I'm here today to tell you all about the delicious new treat from the makers of Good God, They're Sour Candies. Now, those of you who know me know I love sweets. In fact, my pantry is stocked with just about everything sugary. But my new favorite is definitely K. 
Kale Pops. That's right, Kale Pops. Made with 100 of a thousandth of a millionth of kale and genuine corn syrup. Kale Pops are the new lollipop that you can feel good about, feeling your little terror. <laughs> Next time your mini-me asks you for a treat after dinner, hand them a Kale Pop. <laughs> Guaranteed they won't ask you for anything else after that. <laughs> kale Pops are now available in 15 and 20 pound bags at a fine retailer near you. Make sure to stock up for those trick-or-treaters. <laughs> <laughs> like, hi everyone, it's Heather Feathers, your chick with the weathers, back to give you today's tide report. Um, the only problem is that I really don't know how to figure out those little tide table thingies. And the last time I went to the beach, a sneaker wave got my designer shoes all wet. Wah. So here's my advice. If the water is far away, the tide is probably out. And if the water is really close, the tide is probably in. And if the water is getting all over your designer shoes, then you probably shouldn't have worn them to the beach. Just saying. Heather Feathers, over and out. It's Halloween. So, no topic is too gross for K-R-O-W, not even boogers. That's right, I said it. Boogers! <laughs> Our final story is one of those things you should never, ever talk about in polite company. But since it's just you guys, here comes the story of the mucus man. Grab a Kleenex and away we blow. the famous story of Harold Hill and how he visited River City, Iowa with his 76 trombones. But I doubt as many of you know the terrible tale of Harold's first failed attempt. In July 1911, just one year before he arrived in River City, Harold got off the train at a little known town in Iowa called Sneezy Lake. Now Harold was a fast-talking traveling salesman who called himself by any name he wished. When he first arrived in Sneezy Lake, he decided he would be known as Doctor instead of his usual title of Professor. The town of Sneezy Lake was a bit hesitant of letting strangers in, but they desperately needed a new town doctor, and since Harold was carrying a big black suitcase, they assumed it was full of many types of medicines. It wasn't. It was full of underwear, socks, and a very ugly striped suit. But that's not really relevant to the story. Smooth Talking Harold worked his typical angle and decided he should create a situation of concern for the citizens in order to earn their trust. But since Sneezy Lake had no pool hall, Harold convinced the town that he had the cure for all that ailed them. Got a bum leg? Harold could fix it with just a few small taps under the kneecap. Headache? Just put your head upside down in the nearby waterfall, and the water would clean out your head. Heartburn? Harold knew just what to do. He told his patients to strip naked and run around under a full moon. To this day, no one speaks of how the well-known school teacher, Patricia Mansing, ran around for four hours howling like a she-wolf in her cabbage rose garden that late October evening. Ugh. While Harold's cures may have been bogus, they sure did start a whole bunch of weird rumors about all of the other townspeople, throwing the spotlight off Harold, which was exactly what he wanted. Well, one day, Harold met a local veterinarian and part-time piccolo teacher named Widow Harriet Achu, and she was not so easily convinced. She tracked down information at the local library to incriminate Harold and had all the evidence she needed to prove he was a fraud. She was ready to hand it over to Mayor Wim when suddenly she developed a nasty cold. Who else could she turn to but Dr. Harold Hill? After all, there were no other doctors within a 100-mile radius of Sneezy Lake. Somehow, 
Harold managed to nurse widow Harriet Achu back to health, but not before catching her cold himself and passing it to all the members of the entire town. Even the band kids got sick and could barely practice without snot and boogers getting all over their instruments. It was disgusting. Big old snot bubbles were coming out of the trumpets, boogers were oozing out of every hole in the flutes, and green mucus was running down the violins. It was literally disgusting. Eventually, the entire town was so covered in mucus that it totally disappeared off the map. In fact, if you take the number 10 train through Iowa today, you will find a big green swamp bubbling with green pools of slime that sits just about where Sneezy Lake used to be. All the houses sank under the lime green sludge, and once the people recovered from their ailments, most of them moved to Pacoima. Although rumor has it that Harriet Achu became a card shark and part-time showgirl in Atlantic City, and school teacher Patricia Mansing moved to the Oregon coast, where she raised prize-winning snakes and butterflies until she was 106 years old. For a while, amongst his swindler friends, Harold's new name became the Mucus Man, which gave him a great idea as he changed his fake name to Professor and headed directly to River City. Harold chalked his Sneezy Lake epic failure up to science and decided that next time he would take vitamin C and echinacea before stirring up any trouble. So be careful and let's hope you never encounter the mucus man. This is Wolfman Mike, your K-R-O-W DJ with the hairiest chest in the West. We hope you've enjoyed listening to our parking lot radio show here at Crow. Have a safe and happy Halloween from all of us at Crow. Oh.